good evening everyone um, and good morning to some of you thank you for joining us we have a very interesting topic uh, pastor gregory winset is going to be our presenter for today and the topic is hastening christ's return very appropriate topic uh, and i'm sure that we will learn a lot uh, before we uh, start let me remind you to keep your mics mics mute and videos off at all times uh, and please type in your questions in the chat box and i'll read it at the end of the session uh, let's go ahead and have uh, an opening prayer and after that janath will introduce pastor gregory to us after which pastor gregory can uh, start his presentation immediately uh, i know indunilaya is with us may i invite indunilaya to offer the opening prayer Can you hear us, Indrilaya? Okay, there seems to be a technical problem there. Tilanaya, can you hear us? Yeah, sure. Yes, go ahead. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time to talk with you and thank you for this session. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come together and study about various aspects of uh, your love for us today as we discuss this topic is with us and may your holy spirit guide us as uh, for understanding in jesus name i pray amen thank you janat over to you hi bro <clears throat> it's a great privilege for me to introduce pastor greg uh, pastor greg is a uh, missionary in southern asia uh, southern asia division for 16 years now and uh, he is now working as a uh, working at general conference as a director global mission center for uh, southeast asian religion and uh, uh, and pastor greg and uh, mrs pitset has a very loving wonderful family with two sons and uh, i can still remember uh, when he he visited us in 2015 he uh, told us how prayer works and regarding he, he talked regarding uh, the prayer journals and that was really open my mind and, uh, as a, uh, our one year in, and i know Will be a good uh, learning experience for every one of us. Uh, Pastor Greg, this time is. Uh... Well, thank you very much, Janat. It was a very special time we had. I can't believe it's been five years already <laughs> since we were together there. Um, but it's. Uh, I I look forward to the next trip. I hopefully will be able to visit you all in 2021. Uh, the coronavirus here in America is still going on strongly and, and travel has not returned to normal at all yet here. And I continue to work from home, although many of the employees at the General Conference are now working in the building, our office is still working from home, the Office of Adventist Mission. So, but that's okay. God can still work through us in our unusual circumstances. Um, and uh, I hear that life is somewhat returned to normal there um, in terms of going to the office and working and perhaps schools and that sort of thing. So we just pray that you will be blessed there. You know, this topic that I'm going to share with you today, Hastening Christ's Return, is one that we could talk many weeks about this topic. So I am not going to try to share everything that I think would be helpful. I'm just going to focus on one aspect. I believe that we are living in the last days. I believe that the coronavirus is just yet another example of the fact that this world cannot sustain our population um, and our well-being in this fallen sinful world the way it is uh, for very much longer. Um, is it a last plague? No, I don't believe that it is a fulfillment of the seven last plagues of Revelation. Um, but it is certainly a sign of Christ's 
soon return. And I believe with all my heart that um, this needs to be the focus of our attention in our prayer life, in our Bible studies, and uh, more importantly, in our conversations um, and in our discussions as a church. And there may be those who are listening to, to this um, to what I'm going to be sharing, who, who may have never really studied uh, the prophecies of, of Revelation um, of the Bible. And I would invite you to open the book to Revelation and start looking at those things. Um, I'm not going to try to interpret a specific uh, prophecy this morning, but I want to lay a foundation for your future study. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I'm so thankful that we can spend this time together and reflecting on the fact that you have not yet returned. It's been nearly 2,000 years. Uh, we estimate that it was around uh, the year 31 AD that you re died and rose again and then ascended to heaven. And here we are almost 2,000 years later, recognizing that um, you need to return soon because this world cannot continue much longer. Lord, I pray that you would guide our study together, and that you would bless us as, um, as your presence is with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to pull that up now. So give me just a second. So you should be able to see that. I hope that uh, what I have there is going to work for you. So the focus that we have to this morning is hastening Christ's coming. And I would like to begin by talking and sharing a few Bible texts. The, the topic really, the, the title I've chosen is from uh, Peter. You know, Peter was one of the most... Um, forward and visible of the 12 disciples that Jesus had, uh, but he's written very little of the New Testament, even though so much is written about him. He's only written two small letters, and they're named after himself, First and Second Peter, and you'll find those not far from Revelation, just a few books before Revelation. So Second Peter chapter 3 talks about God's promise of Christ's return. Jesus promised that he would return, um, but now the disciples, the ones who had walked with Christ when he was on earth, were beginning to pass away. And so many were beginning to wonder, well, where is this promise of Christ's return? And Peter writes in verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, that knowing this first, that scoffers, Scoffers are people who doubt, people who make fun of. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And, and I'm not going to read further, but it does, Peter talks about how they willfully forget. In, so, in other words, they make it a calculated decision that they aren't going to pay attention to these things anymore. They give up on these. But there's two things in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, that I want to point out. And that is that in the last days, there will be people who will make fun of Bible prophecy, um, or at least completely ignore it. Um, and just kind of doubt, will Jesus return? Is this possible? And that this goes hand in hand with another practice which is walking after lusts. Now, lusts are anything that are gratification of our desires, our sinfulness, you know, our, our fallen nature. So it could be that we have a lust for popularity. We want to be thought highly of. We want to be in all the in groups. It may be that our lust is that we want wealth at any cost, even if it means that we sacrifice principles that we know God has placed there for our blessing, and that violating them actually goes against our walk with God. So we desire wealth more than staying, keeping our integrity and staying faithful to Christ. Other lusts may be pornography, 
sexual lust. Um, this is one that often plagues us um, and it doesn't end. It's just these things just kind of continue in our life. And, and it's possible that we say we, we are just happy to gratify ourselves in these things. Maybe it's how people, per, you know, how we dress, how we look, um, any number of things. But lusts are those things that appeal to our lower nature, to our sinfulness in this world. And so doubting Christ's return and walking in these temptations and, and indulging in temptations go hand in hand. It is very difficult to read the Bible when we know we're not obeying the things that are written in it. It's very difficult to appreciate the prophecies of Christ's return if we are not walking with Christ through life. And so if we begin to indulge our, our lusts, we will also weaken our faith in Christ's return. If our faith in Christ's return begins to weaken, we will be more happy to walk in our lusts. So these two things go together. But let's continue. Peter says that this will happen in the last days, that this is going to be the way it is before Christ's return. Um, and he echoes Jesus in saying that. But in verse 9, he continues that the Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promises. He's not lazy, Peter is saying. So he's not lazy or slow as some count to slackness, but he is long-suffering. He is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but would that all should come to repentance. And so actually the main issue that is delaying Christ's return, and we could also read it in Matthew 24, verse 14, is that the gospel is to be proclaimed amongst all the unreached peoples and unreached cities of the world. Disciples need to be made. When that mission has completed, then Christ will return. Now, there are prophecies. We have the 2300-day prophecy and these different things that play into this. But we, as, for those of you who are students of Bible prophecy, that you understand these things, you recognize that those prophecies have all ended. There are no more time prophecies for us. The only thing that remains is this desire that Christ has that none should perish. He wants everyone to have a chance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It, it will certainly come, but it will come as a surprise, just like the thief comes in the middle of the night. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. So the thief may arrive by surprise. But when he arrives, uh, breaking into our house, don't we wake up if we hear glass shattering? Of course we do. And this is the same with Christ's return. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. You know, you, you've seen in the news recently this uh, horrific explosion that happened in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, it doesn't matter where people were in the city at that hour, even though it came as a surprise, everyone, their life changed in an instant. Sadly, many died, but the majority, it just turned their lives upside down. This is what it will be like when Christ returns, but it won't be one city. It won't be one country, the island of Sri Lanka. It will be the whole entire world. Therefore, Peter continues, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Now, this is where we're getting to our, our, our title for our sermon. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? So we're going to spend a little bit of time unpacking what does it mean to look for and hasten the coming of Christ. And the hint is at the end of verse 11, where it says that we ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. It says there, let us be glad and rejoice and give him, this is Christ, glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, in verse 8, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous 
acts of the saints, or maybe your Bible says the righteousness of the saints. Okay, so here's a very helpful and important passage. Here we're finding that, uh, well, let's unpack a couple of meanings, first of all. First, we see that Christ is getting married. Now, this is obviously not a literal, physical marriage of a man, a single man to a single woman. This is actually talking about when Christ returns. And oftentimes, Jesus used the parable, the, the analogy of a wedding feast, to refer to his second coming, like in Matthew 25 with the bridesmaids, the ten virgins, and how they, the bridegroom was delayed. You remember those stories? So here we see that Jesus is going to have a wedding, um, and we know that because the lamb is a symbol of Jesus in the Old Testament sacrificial system and in the book of Revelation. And who is his wife, though? She's arrayed so beautifully, but what we find throughout the book of Revelation is that the woman is a symbol of the church, and the woman is a symbol of Christ, um, um, Christ's, the, the re, those who are redeemed by Jesus because of his sacrifice for us. Uh, Paul sa says that he betrothed us to Christ when he talks of, to the Corinthians. Um, and he is appealing to them to come back to, to that relationship. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So the idea of this betrothal and marriage is uh, a biblical thing. Um, so what we find in these verses then is that the woman or the church is ready at Christ's second coming. And, she, and, and as God's people, we have made ourselves ready by our clothing, which symbolizes our righteousness. Now, oftentimes we focus on Christ's righteousness. In Revelation chapter 7, it says that our robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's Christ's righteousness that makes us his people. But in this verse, it's very interesting in verse 8 that it's describing the clothing of Christ's bride as being the righteous acts or the righteousness of the saints. And I've struggled with this. How could this be possible? Aren't we supposed to have Christ's righteousness, not our own? Aha. We need to uncover this. We need to understand. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. And if you know your Bibles well, and you're familiar with the Gospels, you'll be aware that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is perhaps the most famous message that Christ ever preached. Um, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And it begins with the Beatitudes or the blessings, and then it continues on with various instructions. But Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we must all study regularly because this is actually describing the government that Christ will set up when he recreates this world and removes sin from it. This is what this world will look like. These are the principles of his kingdom. So Matthew 5, verse 48 is the last verse of the first chapter of these three chapters that cover his Sermon on the Mount. P uh, Jesus says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the clothing of Christ's people is our righteousness because we have become perfect. And a lot of people have struggled. What is this talking about? What is this perfection that we are hearing about? Well, it's God's perfection in us. We are like him. And a lot of people struggle with this idea of Christ's likeness because we want to have Christ's love. We want his forgiveness, his justification. But how is it possible we can be like him? Turn with me to 1 John. Uh, and this is also just following First and Second Peter, uh, back near Revelation, First John chapter three, and we will look at verse four. What is sin? You know, it, it, is it such a big deal? And what exactly is it? First John chapter three, verse four. It says, "Whoever commits sin 
Okay, so remember we talked in 1 Peter chapter 3 about those who walk after lusts, which are the temptations, the fallen side of us. Sin in 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 is defined as whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Breaking God's law. Look at chapter 5, verse 17. Now, please hang with me. This sounds like a lot of bad news because we all know that we sin. I mean, I assume that all of you have, are dealing with problems in your life, with temptations, and that you are experiencing disappointment. I know I am. So hang with me. This sounds, may sound discouraging. But this is biblical truth. And in order to get to God's good news, we must understand the truth. Okay, so let's now look at chapter 5. Just a couple chapters across. 1 John 5, verse 17. Here again, we're defining sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin not leading to death. Well, we're not going to get into that second half of this verse. We don't have time to discuss what is this sin that's not leading to death. Um, but that would be good for a future Bible study. All unrighteousness is sin. So anything that I do that is not righteous is sin. It is breaking God's law. Look at Matthew 23. Now we're jumping around a lot. I hope that you have your Bibles nearby um, and are able to follow these. If nothing else, perhaps take a screen grab and you can study this, you know, take a photo or or copy the screen, and you can study this on your own um, and look at the verses. It's important that you read the verses in your Bible. Now, a lot of people use uh, the Bible on their cell phones, and that's very convenient. But I find that I'm so visual that I forget where verses are found if I'm just using an electronic device. I have to use a physical book because I can remember it easier. So I'd like to get, I have a small little hand Bible here, and um, I find it very helpful just to keep it with me and study it because it's much easier to find my way around the Bible if I have a physical one. Um, but I use the electronic Bible when it's not nearby, so it's obviously both are valuable. Look at Matthew 23 and verse 27. Matthew 23, the context is Jesus is getting close to his crucifixion. The, the leaders, the spiritual leaders who are supposed to be the ones who are most supportive of his mission, um, are actually his biggest enemies. They're fighting against him. And they're all puffed up with their own sense of righteousness. Verse 27, uh, we'll just pull this one verse. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes, these are religious lawyers, scribes and Pharisees. The scribes would also um, copy the Torah, so that which is the Hebrew Bible, and, and they would copy these things so that other, the different synagogues around um, the world could actually use them. So they were good at memorizing scripture and at copying it because there were no printers in Christ's day. They had to do it by hand. So, but Jesus is, is really chastising them. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, people who don't do what they preach. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. All uncleanness, you know, spiders, dust, um, decay. So the Pharisee, the scribe, is someone who looks beautiful, but is in fact spiritually dead. They look holy, but actually are full of sin. And I don't know about you, but I often sense that people, if they knew who I was internally, maybe would look at me differently because I know the secrets of my heart. I know the temptations I struggle with. But the Pharisees felt like they were righteous. They could not see their own sin. One of the worst spiritual conditions the Bible describes is someone who does not recognize their own sinfulness. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But then verse 9 of 1 John 1.9, 1, 
says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the only way we can have Christ's forgiveness and righteousness is if we recognize the sin that's in our lives. But Jesus is identifying that these Pharisees, they don't recognize this problem, that they are dead inside. Perhaps many of you have heard this quote. It's taken from Christ's Object Lessons, and it's often shared in the context of the Second Coming. So Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. What does he mean, the manifestation of himself? Well, Ellen White explains. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So the idea is, is that Christ's character needs to be reproduced in me. It's not just his righteousness for, in place of my unrighteousness, his forgiveness in place of my sin, but then he transforms me to be like him. But it's, Ellen White is saying that he's waiting for his church to be transformed. It seems like we're so busy with life we forget that he's coming. We get carried away with temptations in our lives. And we're not looking like Christ whatsoever. There is no righteousness in us. Will we forever delay Christ's return? Because we never get ready? Is it possible that in our desire to do mission and to make disciples, that we are bringing more sinners into the church. And as a result of bringing more sinners into the church, we can never become a perfect church. So we should maybe stop mission so that sinners don't come into the church. You see the dilemma here? We have to be careful how we read our Bibles and how we read Ellen White to, and not make our assumptions speak in place of what God is trying to communicate to us. Let, we'll come back to this quote. But now I want to start talking about some good news, okay? Turn with me to John chapter 13. The Gospel of John. The focus of John throughout is on faith and belief. Uh, very interesting um, telling of the Gospel. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus says. A new commandment? Do we need more commandments? Well, here's what he says. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He, in verse 35, but by this all will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Okay, so this is a new commandment. Now look at 1 John chapter 2. So back to 1 John. We were just there. And we were looking at 1 John because that's where we were getting the definition of sin, that sin is lawlessness. Look at 1 John chapter 2 this time and verse 7, 7 and 8. Brethren, I have, no, I have no new commandment to you. Oh, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment. What is this old commandment? The old, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Okay, I'm getting confused. Is it a new commandment? Is it an old commandment? What are we talking about? Look, look down a little bit further. Remember the new commandment Jesus was writing? He says, well, you should love each other. Here, Peter is saying, well, this is not a new commandment. It's, some, it's, a, it's a command we've had from the beginning. In verse 9, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. My friends, Jesus was not giving a new commandment in a literal sense. But what had happened is that people got so focused on what sin and unrighteousness is and becoming perfect that they forgot that the law of God is focusing on love. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Okay, let's look at that. God is love. 1 John 4, verse 8. Just a couple of page or two over, depending on your Bible. Verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
Th this is not a new commandment. It is because people haven't thought about it in these terms. It's actually an old commandment. Now let's go back to Matthew 5. This is where we were reading about this perfection that God was talking about. Remember that? Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, what, kind, what is this? It, my friends, we must read the Bible in context. We must read large sections. Have you ever sat down and just read the book of Matthew in one sitting? Or sat down and read Romans in one sitting? A lot of times we only take five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, or we, maybe we're just so happy. Oh, look at this idea. Let me see. Is it somewhere else? And we jump from place to place. But when we read things in their context, we get a very different picture. And it's very important that we do this. Look at verse 43. In my Bible, verse 43 to 48 is a section of the Bible with the title, Love Your Enemies. That's the context. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, so this is the context of Jesus saying that we should be perfect, is to love our enemies. He said in verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. You know, we focus on God as being such a righteous judge that he destroys the wicked. But the Bible, if you read it, actually you find, and if you look at it in reality, the wicked are thriving around us. God is not against them. He wants to save the wicked. Go with me to, um, um, actually, I want to share a story with you. But I, but I want you to look at Luke first. Luke chapter 6. The, Luke 6 is, is Luke's telling of the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse, he begins in verse 27 that you should love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. In verse 32, uh, oh, verse 31, we have the golden rule. Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Verse 32, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. This word credit is actually the word grace. It's the same word, charis, in the Greek language. Charis. If we love people who love us, how is that grace? While we were yet sinners, while we were yet rebellious and enemies of God, God died for us. That is grace. When we love God back, that's not grace because we're loving the one who loves us. Um, I want to illustrate this with a story, and I know a couple of you probably have heard this story because I tell it often. Um, Nikki is a beautiful dog. This is our dog, Nikki. Now, of course, we don't have her anymore. This is when we were living in, in Asia, but now we're living in America. And, and um, when we moved to Bangkok, we couldn't keep the dog living in the city with us, so we had to find another home for it. We lived on the 15th floor of a high-rise building, and that wasn't a place for a dog to live. But li Nikki is living a happy life um, on a farm at this point. When we found her, she was actually crippled. She had a broken back leg, actually the hip, and she was skin and bones. Her fur did not look like this at all. It was all matted, um, grayish color. It was very dirty. But we were driving from uh, across country to the university Asia Pacific International University in Thailand. And um, getting close, the family had all fallen asleep. I was getting tired. And I said, well, we should take a break and get something to eat. So we pulled over to a gas station where there was a convenience store, 7-Eleven, and got out and I saw several dogs. And I called the dogs, but most of them ran away. But this dog actually came over to me. And I was like, wow, it's a nice dog. I thought, you know what, I'm going to get some food for it. So I did. After getting my own things, I came out and gave the dog this little hamburger 
that I'd bought in the refrigerator there in the 7-Eleven. The dog took the food, placed it on the ground, and then licked my hand. I couldn't believe it. Here's this hungry dog, and it's thanking me instead of devouring the food immediately. I turned to my wife and I said, we need to take this dog home. We've been looking for a dog for our, for our boys. They would love to have this dog. And my wife was like, mm, this dog is ugly. It's dirty. It's got a broken leg. I don't think so. Any, and besides, we don't know who it belongs to. I said, well, it's pretty clear. It does, it's just a stray dog. No collar, nothing. She said, well, we're going to the university. There's no way we can take this dog to the university. Let's, if, if we're going to get it, let's get it on the way home. Well, she thought I'd forget. But as we were driving home, I remembered I was watching for the gas station and I found it and I pulled in. My wife's like, what are you doing? I said, well, we're going to pick up our dog. And she was trapped because she had said that we could get it on the way home. So we got the dog and our boys were so excited. My youngest son rode in the back of the truck all the way home with this dog. The dog was very weak. It wasn't very healthy. When we got home, we took it to the vet and the vet said, well, the hip is repairing itself. There's not really much more I could do to help, but uh, the dog is pregnant. It has, um, it looks like it has uh, four, we're gonna have several puppies. Sure enough, a couple weeks later, the puppies are born. And uh, thankfully, many people are happy to have a puppy, so they, we gave them away quickly. We didn't want to have five dogs. But you know, over the coming years, whenever I traveled, the dog would become depressed when I was gone. You'd be very anxious, very worried. And wouldn't eat, maybe a little bit, but not much. But as soon as I got home, this dog was the first one to recognize I was at the gate because a lot of times I would take a taxi from the airport. And um, the dog knew the sound of a taxi in Thailand. Um, and whenever I heard that sound, it would go and look to see if it was me. And, and sure enough, when I would come home, it was there greeting me, ready for me. And the rest of the family would come out. And after the dog had settled down and no longer excited, it would go and eat and eat and eat because it was so hungry from not eating much when I was gone. The dog loved me. And what I realize is I read uh, Luke 6, uh, verse 32, is that this dog is like me, a sinner. It knows how to love those who love it. But that isn't what makes us like Christ. So look at verse 35. Love your enemies, do good and lend to them, hoping for nothing in return. Have you ever loaned something to someone, hoping they wouldn't give it back to you? This is pretty radical. Continuing in verse 35, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons, and I would add daughters, you will be sons and daughters, the children of the Most High. The only way for us to be children of the Most High, the princes and princesses of the Most High, is that we need to love like God loves. We need to be gracious, loving those who don't deserve it, just like God is gracious, loving us when we don't deserve it. So perfection that we find in Matthew 5, 48 is in the context of how well we love and show grace to people around us, as specifically to those who are hard to love. My friends, that's a very different picture. What you see, the Ten Commandments are all based on the idea of the first four, love towards God, and the last six of love towards others. If we want to be God's children, we need to be loving like God is loving to us. We have to pay it forward, pass it forward to others. So then knowing that, let's come back to this quote from Christ's Object Lessons. We were looking at page 69, that Christ will not return until his character is perfectly reproduced in us. Well, look what the context is for that page 69. On page 67 and 68, it says, the plant does not germinate, grow, or bring forth fruit for itself. You know, you think about rice. It doesn't grow for itself, but it grows to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, Isaiah 55, verse 10. Now, sometimes the sower is the eater, 
but sometimes the sower is not the eater, but is going to sell the crop to make money. But Ellen White says, so no man is to live unto himself. The Christian is in the world as a representative of Christ. For what purpose? For the salvation of other souls. My friends, once we have received Christ, we're not sitting around here waiting to be saved. We're sitting around here. Well, hopefully we're not sitting around. We're here on this world to invest in the salvation of other souls. She says there can be no fruitfulness or growth in the life that is centered on self. And sometimes the people who are most focused on forming a Christ-like character are focused on themselves and they will never get it right. That was the problem of the Pharisees and the scribes, the hypocrites. They were so focused on themselves, they could not ever have growth or fruitfulness. If you have accepted Christ as a personal savior, you're to forget yourself and do what? Try to help others. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character. Yes, it's true. We will become less interested in the lusts of the flesh of this world. Your, Elmite continues, your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. And look at this last underlying phrase. Your love be made perfect. Your love be made perfect. Perfect love. And she ends more and more. You will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. My friends, what I'm here to tell you today is that God's love needs to become the motive and power and force in our lives that cannot be stopped even when we come up against an enemy, even against the person that's hard to love, that that love continues to flow. That's what it means to be Christ-like. We're almost done. I apologize. I know we're looking at many verses, but look at James chapter 1. So we have to go back there next to Peter. James comes just before the book of 1 Peter. James chapter 1, verse 27. What do you read there? This is an excellent definition. We've been looking at the definitions of sin. Sin is lawlessness, but now we're seeing that sin also means that we're not loving. But look at verse 27 of James chapter 1. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Okay, so here's the definition of pure religion. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So there's two things. One is that we are not to be spotted from the world. We are not to be fulfilling our lusts. We're not to be falling into temptations and all these evil things. But two is that we are to love others. You know, Jesus said that the Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs. Well, let's take that analogy of death. If our definition of sin was breaking God's law, then that would mean a dead person is righteous because the dead don't do anything. That would mean the person in the hospital who is in a coma, who has no thoughts, no consciousness, that that's a righteous person because they are not sinning. But my friends, that is not the full definition of sin or of what righteousness is. Pure religion, pure righteousness is not only not sinning, but it's doing good and loving others. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says that sin is when we know to do good, but we don't do it. Let's look at Matthew 16. We're almost done. Matthew 16, verse 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. For what profit is it to a man or a woman if he gains the whole world 
and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So a disciple, any, any disciple of Christ is someone who denies self, takes the cross, and are willing to lose out in this life for the sake of Christ. That's, who, that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. So I want to challenge you. If, will you look for and hasten Christ's return? Is that what you can, will, are willing to do in your life? Well, if you do, this is what it requires. You may follow Jesus if, one, you spend time with Jesus. Prayer and Bible study. And as Janat mentioned earlier, I really try to encourage people that prayer is not just dumping information and asking God to fix it. Prayer is also listening to God's voice and sensing what his will is for your life. Many people don't know God's will. I, it's a whole nother sermon. But it's very easy to know God's will if you take time to listen. We have to spend time in prayer and Bible study. The Bible tunes our ear to hear God's voice. The Bible does not tell you who you're supposed to marry, what job you're supposed to take, what you should do today. How should you work with your, your neighbor? How should I love my enemy? The Bible won't tell you specifically what to do. It gives you the principles. And so we must read the Bible to sensitize our ears to knowing God's voice. And then when we listen quietly in prayer, he will prompt you and tell you. If we're not spending time with Jesus, learning to recognize his voice in our lives, how can we follow him? The second thing that we need to do to look for and hasten Christ's return is that when we know God's will for our lives, we must surrender that. And we need to obey him. Of course, we have the, the basic commandment that we are to love others as Christ has first loved us. Okay? So love is a very basic thing. We have the Ten Commandments that makes it clear what that love should look like. But then there are all the little specific things in our life that we need to continue to surrender and obey Christ as he prompts us through his Holy Spirit. A third way that we can look for and hasten Christ's return is that we must resist Satan's deceptions. Because every temptation, everything in this world that looks good to us, that looks pleasurable to us, is a deception of Satan to separate us from Christ. It's a deception of Satan to keep us locked into the things of this world and not prepare for Christ's soon return. We must resist those temptations and Satan's work on our lusts. Fourth and last, we need to learn to love those who don't deserve it. Now, so often we think of love as this warm, fuzzy feeling. And that's true. That's part of love. But love is much more than that. Love is how we live. Love is how, what we do. How do we help those who don't deserve our help? Now, obviously, we should help those who do deserve it, our family, uh, brothers and sisters in, in, in who are followers of Christ, of course we should love them. We should be known that we are a loving people by how we live and interact with that. But we can't just love those in the church and then our family. We must love those outside and even those who are difficult to love. I'm suggesting that if we want to see Christ return in our day, we must do all four of these things. We must spend time with Jesus. We must surrender and obey ourselves to him to obey him we must with his help resist the temptations to follow after our lusts and four we must learn to love like jesus loves even to those who don't deserve it as we do this and as we share the testimony of how god is changing me we will find that there will be a lot of power in what we tell other people and that they will also want to have that same benefit Christ is coming soon, and I pray that we will all be looking for and hastening.
is in return. Thank you very much, Pastor. Let's go directly into the questions. Uh, and we have one question. Um, love without expecting anything back is not practical without God's guidance. How can we have that guidance and how can we practice it in the real world? Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. Um, the only way that I know to practice God's guidance is I have to slow down and I have to listen. And what I do to practice that is I actually use a prayer journal. Because when I pray without a journal, um, I find that I just pray quickly and keep going. I'm much too task oriented. I don't take time. So I find that it, with a prayer journal, I take the time and I use different colors. Well, my screen is kind of funny here. I use different colors uh, in my prayer journal to represent different things. For example, prayer requests are always purple. Um, when I'm listening to God for God to give me instruction, um, I always, whatever I hear something, I always write that in a green color ink. Um, I'm not saying you need to do a journal or to, to do color to journaling as you pray, but what you do have to do is that you have to take time after you ask for God's help to listen. And there's several principles. The first one is whatever problem or issue you're facing, you need to confess whatever problem you have contributed to it. Um, so you, we must confess our sins so that there's not those sins that are separating us from God and his instruction in our life. So we must first be fed and be fully surrendered to God. The second thing is that we need to be serious about listening for those promptings of the Holy Spirit. If we are spending time in the Bible study, we will have an ear for God's voice and not just our own ideas or the devil's temptations. And we'll recognize when he speaks. Um, but when he speaks, then we must decide, are we going to obey it? Because the blessing won't come if we don't obey what God is instructing us to do. And when we do it and God blesses, the last thing we must do is we must tell other people how God is teaching us to listen for his voice. I've had the experience many times where I was completely humbled. And I didn't want to share this story because it was, it was my reputation on the line. But when I saw that God was working with me and people were asking what happened, I just tell them, God is teaching me to listen to his voice. This is what meditation is all about. It's, it's, it's thinking and deeply pondering the meaning of, of Bible texts. Meditation is about listening for God's voice and asking for how to deal with problems. I tell you, if you practice this, your prayer life will never be the same. And I, I hope you would, you would try that. If you're interested in more on that, feel free to contact me. I, I have some uh, things, that, Bible study and readings on how to do this in more detail. Thank you, Pastor. Let's go to the second question. Ro Romans 3.10 says that there is no one righteous, not even one. Looking at our churches today, we find that it is still true. Ellen G. White says that we have to manifest Christ in our lives. It appears that none in our SDA church has reached this standard. It, is all, it almost sounds impossible. How can we not lose courage when trying to reach the standard? Well, I, friend, I would just point you to Peter. We read a little bit of his things today. That was our main text that we focused on. Um, when Peter was focused on Christ, God worked in his life amazingly. When Peter focused on his own life, he failed miserably. He denied his Lord three times uh, when people are at, at, the, at the judgment of Christ before his crucifixion, he kept denying, oh, I don't know anything about him. Why? Because he was trying to focus on saving his life. He didn't want to be crucified as well. But when Peter was focused on Christ, he did amazing things. He, you know, he asked Jesus, uh, at first they thought it was a ghost walking on the water. And then he says, well, if that's really you, invite me to come out. And, and Jesus said, come. And so Peter steps out on the water. Why would a man do that? For one reason, his eyes were focused on Christ. And then as he's walking towards Christ on the stormy waters, he begins to sink because he was looking away 
uh, fearful of all of these, uh, the, the waves and that he would sink. And sure enough, he sank. So the reason why we experience, and you know, you, the, the question kind of focused on in all the church, um, focus on yourself, focus on me. If, if I am always focused on, on myself and on my problems or on other people's problems, guess what? I can't be Christ-like. Only by focusing on Christ can I become Christ-like. And it's not by focusing on Christ so that I can, I can have victory over sin. No, that's not the purpose. The purpose of focusing on Christ is to love him, to respond to his love for us, and then to go and love other people. And the sins that we commit will naturally become less, the temptations will become less um, gripping on our lives and we'll have more victory as we focus on these positive things. Um, it's impossible to ride a bike standing still. Now there are some experts that are really good at balance, but as a general rule, if you want to balance a bike, you need to be headed and going somewhere, not focusing on balancing, but focusing on traveling. <laughs> and that's the same thing with the scripture. I don't know. These are some helpful thoughts that maybe uh, partially answers the question. It is quite common to see that the church citing the church cites policies and procedures and not, does not take decisions that display God's love. What can the church as a body of believers do at a time like that? Well, you know, let me just say two things. The first is, that the purpose of the committees and policies of the church are supposed to be that we can stay united in how we follow Christ. But because we as individuals can be sinful and lose sight of Christ and be focused on other things, that we can bring politics into the church. We can bring problems into the church. And this grieves our Father, as well as it grieves those who are uh, disappointed by the decisions being made. The best thing that we can be doing is to make sure that we live a different life ourselves. Um, you know, the leaders are the product of the people. <laughs> um, and I would say that the responsibility of the youth should be, and I'm talking about youth as in anybody who's not older, so young adults as well, our focus should be on Christ and on those outside the church, how to reach them. And, and we need to work together to reach those people. When we come to church, focus only on one thing, sharing the testimony of how God is changing you, what God is doing through you, and sharing that to be an inspiration to others. And I guarantee you that if you focus on doing that in your church, the politics and the problems will become less important to you, less apart, consumed in your attention, and you'll be much better able to focus on the positive. Don't allow problems to hijack your joy and love for God, because that's exactly what the devil's trying to do. Don't fall for it, because you will never, this side of heaven, find a church that does not have some kind of politics. Now, some churches are much healthier than others. Some conference or missions are much healthier than others. But the bottom line is, the church is made up of sinners like you and me. So let's focus on where we should be focused on. And um, you can't change other people. You can't change the church. You, the only person you can change is yourself. Otherwise, you'll get consumed with anger, with frustration, with disappointment. But we should be praying for God's blessing and his help um, for those we see. But don't dwell on that. It, it will take all the joy away if you focus on those things. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor. Um, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, this was certainly a very interesting uh, session and we will post it on YouTube so that uh, uh, many other people can view it. Thank you very much for preparing uh, and also uh, presenting it in such a nice way. Let me remind the audience that our next session will be on the 16th of August, same time, 7 p.m. Sri Lankan time. And the presenter will be Pastor Dennis Davidson. And the topic is, sorry, not me. So that is something to look forward to. <laughs> to end the session, Pastor Gregory, could you offer us a closing prayer?
Of course. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are our father. We are your sons and daughters. Um, because you love us, you experience a lot of pain. If you don't care, then you don't have pain. A lot of times we protect ourselves from pain by just looking the other way, by not caring, by not being moved by the problems. But you love us infinitely. Uh, and as a result, when we are far from you, you have infinite pain. And so, Lord, I just ask that we would cause you less pain by responding to your love, by connecting with you on a personal basis, that our religion would not be a theory, it would not be a series of doctrines, but it would be a personal experience. Yes, those theories and doctrines all have their place, but it only should be in the term of how we relate to you and then how that helps us to live in relation to our brothers and sisters around us. Lord, I pray that for every person who's been a part of this or will listen to this in the future, that you would bless them, that we would keep our eyes focused on Christ. We love you, and we do wish that Jesus would come very soon. Transform us. Help us to be looking for and hastening your soon return. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. Wishing you a good night or a good day. God bless. God bless you all.